dedicated to my son Sean Anthony Steele, in loving memory of my father Richard Steele. Chapters VI. It remains therefore, that we should pass to the discussion of Adrastia, Socrates indicating that she possesses her kingdom in this place. For that which defines the measures of a blameless life to souls from the vision of these intelligible goods, is certainly there allotted its first evolution into light, for the elevating cause, being secondary to the objects of desire, may be able to raise both itself and other things to the super-celestial place, through conversion, but that which defines and measures the fruits of the vision of the intelligible to souls, since it has its epoxies in the intelligible, imparts by illumination beatitude to them from thence. It is established therefore, as I have said, in that place, but it rules over all the divine laws uniformly, from on high, as far as to the last of things, it likewise binds to the one sacred law of itself, all the sacred laws, viz the intellectual, the supermundane, and the mundane, whether therefore, there are certain Saturnian laws, as Socrates in the Gorgias indicates there are, when he says, the law therefore which was in the time of Saturn is now also among the gods or whether there are Jovian laws, as the Athenian guest asserts there are, when he says, but justice follows Jupiter, which is the avenger of those that desert the divine law, or whether there are fatal laws, as Tsamos teaches there are, when he says, that the Demiurgus announced to souls the laws of fate, of all these the sacred law of Adrastia is connective according to one intelligible simplicity, and at the same time imparts existence to all of them, and the measures of power and if it be requisite to relate my own opinion, the inevitable guardian power of this triad, and the immutable comprehension of order pervading everywhere, presubsist in this goddess, for these three deities not only unfold and collect all things, but they are also guardians according to the oracle of the works of the Father, and of one intelligible intellect, this guardian power therefore, the sacred law of Adrastia indicates, which nothing is able to escape, for with respect to the laws of fate, not only the gods are superior to them, but also partial souls, when they live according to intellect, and give themselves up to the light of providence, and the Saturnian gods are essentially exempt from the Jovian laws, and the connective and perfective gods from the Saturnian laws, but all things are obedient to the sacred law of Adrastia, and all the distributions of the gods, and all measures and guardianships subsist on account of this, by Orpheus also, she is said to guard the Demiurgus of the universe and receiving brazen drumsticks, and a drum made from the skin of a goat, to produce so loud a sound as to convert all the gods to herself, and Socrates imitating this fabulous sound which extends a certain proclamation, 17, to all things, in a similar manner produces the sacred law of Adrastia to all souls, for he says, this is the sacred law of Adrastia, that whatever soul has perceived anything of truth, shall be free from harm till another period, all but expressing the Orphic sound through this proclamation, and uttering this as a certain hymn of Adrastia, for in the first place indeed, he calls it Thesmos, a sacred law, and not Nomos, a law, as he does the Saturnian and Jovian laws, for Thesmos, is connected with deity, and pertains more to intelligibles, than to the intellectuals, but Nomos, indicating intellectual distribution, is adapted to the intellectual fathers, and in the second place, he speaks of it in the singular and not in the plural number, as Tsamos does of the fatal laws, in the third place therefore, he extends it to all the genera of souls, and evinces that it is the common measure of their happy and blessed life, and the true guard of those souls that are able to abide on high free from all passivity, for such is the meaning of the words. And the soul that is able to do this always, shall always be free from harm, this sacred law therefore, comprehends all the undefiled life of divine souls, and the temporal blessedness of partial souls, and it guards the former indeed intelligibly, but measures the latter by the vision of intelligible goods, and thus much concerning Adrastia. Chapters VIE. With respect to what remains therefore, we shall summarily say, that the super-celestial place is the first triad of the intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods, possessing three peculiarities, the unfolding into light, the collective, and the defensive, it likewise comprehends all these intelligibly, and in an unknown manner, conjoining indeed intellectuals to intelligibles, but calling forth the prolific powers of intelligibles, receiving in itself the plenitude of forms from the intelligible paradigms, and producing its own meadow from the frontal summit which is there, 
but from the one intellect it gives subsistence to the three virtues, perfects all itself by intelligible impressions, and in its ineffable bosoms receives a whole of intelligible light, at one and the same. Time also it abides in the occult nature of the intelligible gods, and proceeds intelligibly from thence, shines forth to the view of intellectuals, and converts and draws upward by ineffable powers all the images of its proper union which it has disseminated in everything, to this place likewise it is necessary that we should mystically approach, leaving in the earth all the generation producing life, and the corporeal nature, with which on coming hither we were surrounded as with a wall but exciting alone the summit of the soul to the participation of total truth, and the plenitude of intelligible nutriment. Chapter 6. After this intelligible and unknown triad however, which presides over all the intellectual, 18, genera, let us survey the triad which connectedly contains the bond of them, intelligibly and at the same time intellectually, for it is necessary that prior to intellect and the intellectual gods, the cause of connectedly containing should be in these gods, and that this being established in the middle of the intelligible and intellectual order, should extend to all the divine multitudes, all the genera of beings, and all the divisions of the world, for what is it which primarily connects things, if, as some say, the nature of spirit and local motion, body itself which is connective of other things will require connection, for every body according to its own composition is dissipable and divisible, which also the Aline guest indicating to those who make corporeal principles, says that the essence which is so much celebrated by them, is broken and dissipated, body therefore, is not naturally adapted to be connective of other things, nor even if a power of this kind pertained to bodies, would spirit be able to afford us this power, because it is always deathless and dissipated, and diffusing itself beyond that which bounds it. But if we suppose that habits and connective forms which are divided about bodies illuminate their subjects with connection, it is perfectly necessary that they should effect this by being present with them, but how will these habits and forms connect themselves, for it is difficult to devise how this can be effected, for these being distributed about material bulks, and divided together with their subjects, require a boundary and connection, but they are not naturally adapted to be bounded or connected from themselves, because they have not an essence self-begotten and self-subsistent, that however, which neither produces nor perfects itself, cannot connect itself, and moreover, every habit, and every material form is automotive, and depends on another more ancient cause, and on this account is inseparable from subjects, not being able to verge to itself, but if abandoning these, we should assert that souls which are incorporeal and self-begotten, are the first efficient causes of connection, where shall we place the partible and at the same time impartible nature of souls, that which is mixed from the partible and impartible, that which participates of the genera of being, and that which is divided into harmonic reasons, for souls indeed, connect bodies and natures, because they participate of an impartible peculiarity, but they are in want of another connective nature which may impart the first principle of mixture to the genera, and of connection to divided reasons. For the self-motive nature of souls being transitive, and extended to time, requires that which may connect its one life, and may render it total and indivisible, for the whole which is connective of parts, exists prior to parts, since the whole which consists of parts receives connection introduced from something different from itself, but if proceeding with the reasoning power beyond souls, we survey intellect, whether the intellect which has participated, or if you are willing, that which is imparticipable and divine, and in short, if we survey at once the intellectual genus of the gods, if this is primarily connective of beings, we shall find also in this all various multitude, divisions of genera, and as Socrates says, many and blessed visions, and discursive energies, for the separation of divine natures, and the variety of forms, present themselves to the view in intellectuals, and also fabulous sections and generative powers, how therefore, can that which connects be primarily here, where the divisive genus shines forth, and how is it possible that intellectual multitude should not refer to another more ancient cause the participation of its proper connection, for intellectual multitude is that which is primarily connected, since it is that which is primarily divided, and that which requires connection is divisible, but the indivisible itself is beyond the connective hypoxis, but it is not that which primarily connects, for everything which is connected, is connected by another thing which primarily possesses the power of connection, it is evident therefore. 
from what has been said, that the connective order of beings is established prior to the intellectual gods, the intelligible indeed, and occult epoxis, is the supplier of union to all things, as proximately subsisting after the one, and being indivisible and uniform, but connection is the contraction of multitude into impartable communion, on which account it subsists as secondary to intelligibles, for the medium which was there was intelligible, and the united primarily efficient cause of connection, the connective however, of intelligibles and intellectuals, imitates the unific power of intelligibles, for there the three triadic monads were the unions of wholes, one of them indeed according to transcendency, another according to the middle center, and another according to conversion, but in the intelligible and at the same time intellectual orders, these three triads are the second after those unions, and are connoissant with multitude. Hence one of these triads is collective, another is connective of multitude, and another is of a perfective nature, for that which is collected, that which is connected, 19, and that which is perfected, is multitude, whether therefore it is intellectual, or super mundane, or mundane, or any other multitude, it is collected, connected, and perfected through these three triads, and when collected indeed, it is elevated to the union of intelligibles and is firmly established in them, when it is connected, it abides impartable and undissipated in its progeny, and when it is perfected, it receives completion from its proper parts or powers, since however, it is necessary that beings abiding, proceeding and returning should enjoy this triple providence, there are indeed three pre-existent collective monads, three connective, and three perfective, monads, and we do not say this, that on account of the good of secondary natures, First natures are thus divided, and preside over so many orders and powers, but they indeed are always the primary causes of good to things subordinate, while we from inferior natures recur to the causes of wholes, the intelligible therefore, and intellectual triads, perfect things triadically, and always connect and collect them into union, but the intelligible monads generate without separation and unically, their permanences, progressions and conversions, with respect to other things however, we have partly spoken, and shall again partly speak concerning them. Chapter XX. Let us therefore speak at present concerning the connective triad. This then, Socrates, in the Phaedrus, calls the celestial circulation, because indeed, it possesses the middle center of imparticipable life, and is that which is most vital itself of life, he calls it circulation, as comprehending circularly, and on all sides all other lives, and divine intellections. For on account of this, souls also which are elevated to it, are perfected according to intellection, and are conjoined with intelligible spectacles. The circulation of the heaven, however, is always established after the same manner, for it is an eternal, whole, one, and united intelligence. But the circulation of souls is effected through time, subsists in a more partial manner, and is not an at once collected comprehension of intelligibles. Souls, therefore, are carried round in a circle and are restored to their pristine state, the celestial circulation always remaining the same, because, however, it gives completion to the bond of the intelligible and intellectual gods, and connects all the orders in their abiding, proceeding, and returning, Socrates calls it celestial, Fotsamos says, that this, sensible, heaven also, compresses on all sides the L. Ments that are under it, and that on this account, no place is left for a vacuum, as, therefore, the apparent heaven is connective of all things that are under it, and is the cause of continuity, coherence and sympathy, for the intervention of a vacuum would interrupt the continuity of things, and the subversion of this continuity would destroy the sympathy of bodies thus also that intellectual heaven, binds all the multitudes of beings into an impartable communion, illuminating each with an appropriate portion of connection, for intellect participates of the connective cause in one way, the nature of soul in another, and a corporeal state of being in another, for through the highest participation of connection, intellect is impartable, but through second measures of participation, soul is partable and impartable, according to one mixture, and through an ultimate diminution, bodies possessing a partable hypostasis, at the same time remain connected, and do not in consequence of being dissipated perish, but enjoy their own division and imbecility. The whole of the connective triad therefore, is denominated heaven according to the hypoxis of itself, but the breadth of life which is spread under it is called circulation, for in things apparent to sense, the period of the heavens is motion, and is as it were the life of body. Chapters C. 
If however it be requisite to discover the triadic nature of it from what has been laid down, we must employ the mode of analogy, since therefore Plato himself calls the back of the heaven one thing, and its profundity another, it is evident that the celestial arch is the third thing, for the arch which is under this, he directly calls sub-celestial. But as we say that the super-celestial place is established above the back of the heaven, so likewise we must grant that the sub-celestial is different from the celestial arch, for the heaven is bounded, supernally indeed by the back, but beneath by the arch, and it is comprehended indeed by the super-celestial place, but it comprehends the sub-celestial arch. It is evident therefore from these things, that the heaven presents itself to our view as triadic, according to its back indeed, connectedly containing all things in one simplicity, but according to its arch bounding the whole triad, and according to its profundity, itself proceeding into itself, and constituting the middle breadth of connection and coherence, the back however, of the whole celestial order, is an intelligible deity, being perhaps allotted from hence this appellation, but it is intelligible as in the connective triad, externally compressing, and connectedly comprehending all the kingdom of the heaven. It likewise imparts to all the gods by illumination a uniform and simple comprehension of secondary natures, and is supernally filled with intelligible union. Hence also, divine souls being led through all the celestial profundity, stand indeed on the back of the heaven, but the circulation carries them round as they stand, and thus they survey what is called the super-celestial place. The station therefore, is the establishment of souls in the intelligible watchtower of the heaven, extending to souls sameness undefiled power, an undeviating intellection, but the circumduction is the participation of a life full of vigor, and the most acute energy, and the common presence of both these, comprehends the prolific energy, the quiet motion, and the stable intellection of intelligibles, but the celestial profundity, is the one continuity of the whole triad, and the middle deity which conjoins the whole, twenty, celestial order, proceeding indeed, from the intelligible comprehension, but ending in the celestial arch, which defines the boundary of the whole of the heaven. There is therefore, one union and connection of all this triad, and an indissoluble progression from the back as far as to the arch, through this middle deity which is connoissant with both the extremes, and which unfolds indeed the connective multitude, but on each side is bounded by the extremes, one of which comprehends it supernally, but the other from beneath bounds its progression. The celestial arch therefore remains, which is the boundary beneath of the triad, and this is also the case with the intellect which is in it, being filled indeed by life, but united by the intelligible, and converting all the triad to its principle, for the arch also is similar to the back of the heaven, though according to interval it is less, through subjection therefore it is diminished, but through similitude it is converted to the celestial summit, and this is the celestial intellect which is the proximate sunotius, 21 of the sub-celestial arch, hence each, 22, arch is called the intellectual boundary of the intelligible and intellectual gods. The whole connective triad therefore, is allotted such a division as this, the back, tonoton, according to the intelligible, katatonoiton, the profundity according to life, and the arch according to intellect, but the whole of it is one and continued, because that which connects all other things, ought much more to be connective of itself. For each peculiarity of the gods begins its energy from itself, the peculiarity indeed, which is collective, fixing itself collectively in the highest union, that which is convertive of wholes, converting itself to the principle, and that which is undefiled preserving itself prior to other things pure from matter, hence the connective peculiarity also, prior to its participants, connects itself intelligibly and intellectually, and through this connection the nature of the heaven is asserted to be one and continued for all the triad converges to itself, and preserves its proper wholeness united, and most similar to itself according to nature, and the arch indeed, proximately connects all intellectuals, and compresses them on all sides, but prior to this, the celestial profundity itself, which also comprehends the arch, binds together the whole orders, and prior to these, the celestial back uniformly comprehends according to one ambit of simplicity, all the celestial kingdom itself, and all things that are contained under it, and binds them to themselves, by connective power and hypoxis, for in the things also that are apparent to sense, the concave circumference of the heavens, proximately compresses the elements, and does not suffer them in their indefinite motions on all sides, to be dissipated and blown away, 
and still prior to these, the celestial bulk strongly compresses and impels all things to the middle, and leaves no void place, but there is one comprehension of all these, viz the back of the heavens, which is the cause to the heavens of similitude, and to the elements of contact with the heavens, for the smooth and equable nature of the back of the heavens as Timor says, makes the whole of heaven similar to itself, and always the natures which comprehend are connective of the natures that are comprehended, it is necessary therefore from things that are apparent, to transfer the similitude to the father of the intellectual gods, heaven, and to survey how he is both one and triple, supernally indeed, and beneath, possessing the intelligible and intellect, but according to the middle possessing life, which being the cause of progressions and intervals, and generative powers, we have properly arranged a chord. Ain't to interval under the celestial profundity, 23, since Plato himself also calls the sum at the back, for those, says he, that are called immortals, when proceeding beyond the heaven they arrive at the summit, stand on the back of the heaven, he calls therefore, the summit of the celestial order, and beyond, the back of the heaven, which things are in a remarkable manner the prerogatives of the first of the synoches, for connectedly containing all things in the one summit of his hypoxis, according to the oracle, he wholly exists beyond, and is united to the super celestial place, and to the ineffable power of it, being enclosed on all sides by it, and shutting himself in the uniform comprehension of intelligibles, for what difference is there between saying that the first of the synoches is shut in the intelligible place of survey, and evincing that it is proximately comprehended by the super celestial place, which was intelligible, but expanded in intellectuals, if however, that which is beyond is the first, the summit is evidently co-arranged with the rest, and is exempt from them, but if the first is a thing of this kind, being established according to the intelligible summit, and imparting by illumination to the other gods, contact with the intelligible. And with the paternal port, it is indeed necessary that there should be a middle and an extremity, the one according to the celestial profundity, but the other according to the termination of the whole circulation, if however the circulation of the whole of the heaven is one and continued, the peculiarity of this order must be assigned as the cause of this, for being connective of the whole orders of the gods, and prior to other things of itself, and being as it were the center and bond of the divine genera, it in the first place binds and connects itself, and extends itself to one life the heaven therefore is one and at the same time triple, and proceeds into three monads, being both unapparent and apparent, and that which is between these, and imitating the intelligible gods who subside into intelligible triads. Chapters XI. If you are willing however from what is written in the Cratylus, to see the peculiarity of this order, in the first place, let this be considered by you as an argument of the Sinosha established in the middle, that a twofold habitude of it is delivered, one, towards intelligibles, but the other towards intellectuals, for it is said to see the things above, and to generate a pure intellect, hence, of intelligibles it is the intelligence, but of intellectuals the intelligible, for the cause of intellect subsists prior to an intellectual cause, and that which is at once both these, especially gives completion to the middle order of intelligibles and intellectuals, for the collective deity, perceiving intelligibles, or rather being united to them, does not primarily give subsistence to a divine intellect, and the perfective deity, producing together with the middle divinity intellectuals, proximately perceives intellectually the celestial order and not the intelligibles prior to the heaven, but the middle divinity alone, occupying the intelligible and intellectual center, equally indeed extends to both, but perceiving intelligibles intellectually, it is the cause of intellectuals intelligibly, since however, habitude to its causes precedes the power, 24, in it which is generative of intellectuals, Socrates beginning from this habitude, delivers also a second power suspended from it but sight directed to things above is very properly assigned the appellation of celestial, as seeing the things above, this therefore, perfectly defines for us a habitude more ancient than the connectedly containing order, jointly. Assuming it to be intellectual as with reference to intelligibles, and sight as with reference to the objects of sight, though it intellectually perceives itself, and is intelligible in itself, but the intelligible of it, as with reference to that which is primarily intelligible, is allotted an intellectual order, what follows however, unfolds the habitude of this middle to intellectuals, for Socrates adds, whence also, O Hermogenes, those who are conversant with things on high say that heaven generates a pure intellect, and that this name is properly assigned to it, 
The order therefore, of the heaven is expanded as a middle in the middle intellectual and intelligible gods, comprehending at once the intelligible and intellectual in one impartable connection, subsisting similarly with respect to each of these, and being equally distant from the first intellectuals, and the unical intelligibles, hence it is said to perceive intellectually the things above, and thus to produce, a pure, intellect, assuming this therefore, in the first place from what has been laid down, in the next place we should attend to this, that the celestial order being triple, and the whole of it intellectually perceiving intelligibles, and producing intellectuals, the first monad ended in an eminent manner intellectually perceives intelligibles, for it mingles itself with intelligibles, knows intelligible intellect, is united to the natures prior to itself, and is impartable as in impartables, super expanding itself towards intelligible simplicity. But the third monad is especially generative of intellectuals, since it is the intellect of the whole connective triad, and with the Orphic theologists also, heaven the father of Saturn is the third, but the middle monad produces together with the third the intellectual order of the gods, but is conjoined together with the first two intelligibles, and is filled indeed with intelligible union from the firsts, but fills the third, twenty-five, with prolific powers, do you not see therefore, how Plato through the peculiarity of the extremes, unfolds to us the whole celestial order, conjoining indeed, the intelligible hypoxis of it to intelligibles, but its intellectual hypoxis to intellectuals, and affording us the means of collecting its hypoxis which is the middle of both these, and which proceeds according to a common peculiarity, for if you likewise wish to assume this from what has been said, the celestial light is conjoined to the light of intelligibles, for sight is nothing else than light, the middle order therefore, by its own light, and by the divine summit of itself is conjoined to the first natures, but by an intellectual nature, and the boundary of the whole triad, it generates intellect, and all the unpolluted deity of intellectuals, for it does not produce intellect by itself, but in conjunction with purity, for this Socrates himself asserts, whence also, they say, that a pure intellect is generated by it, hence the celestial order is the first efficient cause of the intellectual hypoxis, and of undefiled power, if however it is necessary that purity should not be inherent in intellect from accident, it is the deity of those beings that are exempt from secondary natures, and is the supplier of immutable power, which the mighty heaven producing in conjunction with intellect, is at the same time the efficient cause of the gods who are the sources of purity, and of the intellectual fathers, these indications therefore of the truth concerning the connective gods, may also be assumed from the Cratylus. Chapters Xie. It remains therefore that in conformity to what is written in the Phaedrus, we should survey the sub-celestial arch, and the peculiarity of the gods that are there, before however we begin the doctrine concerning it, I wish to premise thus much, that some of the most celebrated of the interpreters prior to us, conceiving that this sub-celestial arch is a divine order arranged under the heaven, have thought fit to rank it immediately after the first god, calling the first god heaven but others have arranged both the heaven, and the sub-celestial arch in the breadth of intelligibles, for the Asinan philosopher indeed, Theodorus, being persuaded by Plotinus, calls that which proximately proceeds from the ineffable, the sub-celestial arch, as in his treatise concerning names he philosophizes about these things, but the great Iamblichus conceiving the mighty heaven to be a certain order of the intelligible gods, and in one place he considers it to be the same with the Demiurgus, asserts that the order proximately established under the heaven, and as it were begirding it, is the sub-celestial arch, and these things he has written in his commentaries on the Phaedrus, let no one therefore think that we make any innovation concerning the theology of this order, and that we are the first who divide the sub-celestial arch from the heaven, but that we are principally persuaded by Plato, who distinguishes these three orders, the super-celestial place, the celestial circulation, and the sub-celestial arch, and that after Plato, we are persuaded by those who investigate his theory in a divinely inspired manner, viz. by Iamblichus and Theodorus, for why is it necessary to speak of our leader, Serenus, who was truly a Bacchus, i.e. one agitated with divine fury, and who in a remarkable manner was full of deity about Plato, and caused as far as to us the admirable nature of the Platonic theory, and the astonishment with which it is attended, to shine forth. He therefore in his treatise on the Concord of Orpheus, Pythagoras, and Plato, has most perfectly unfolded the peculiarity of this order, the sub-celestial arch, the two above-mentioned wise men, however, 
differ very much from each other in their theory, for Theodorus, in calling the first cause heaven, does not any longer permit heaven to be sight perceiving the things above, as Socrates in the Cratylus etymologizes it to be, for the first god neither sees, nor is sight, nor is inferior to anything, neither therefore does Theodorus admit this explanation of the name, nor does he celebrate the super celestial place, as Socrates does wider the influence of divine inspiration, for there is neither any place, nor intelligible of the one, nor any multitude of forms, nor does the genus of souls ascend beyond the first god, since there is not anything beyond him, but the divine Iamblichus, as he supposes that heaven subsists indefinitely after the first cause, and as he has not delivered the peculiarity of its epoxis, he is indeed pure from the above mentioned doubts, but he should teach us what the celestial order is, how it subsists, and what genus of gods prior to the demiurgus gives completion to it, he however who has perfected everything, on this subject, and has confirmed all that he has said by invincible arguments, is our preceptor, Serenus, who has surveyed all the orders between the first god, and the kingdom of the heaven, and who has intellectually beheld the peculiarity of this order, and has delivered to us his mystics the accurate truth concerning it, in this way therefore, our fathers and grandfathers differ from each other, but all of them in common distinguish the sub-celestial arch from the celestial circulation. Chapters Civ. This therefore must also be supposed by us, and likewise in addition to this, that this order of gods, the sub-celestial arch, is proximately arranged under the heaven, hence, since a heaven being one and triple, is allotted the connective order, but the super-celestial place is allotted the highest order of the intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods, it is undoubtedly necessary that the sub-celestial arch should terminate the middle progression of the gods, should close this whole order and convert it to its principle, and that it should receive an order which is secondary indeed to the heaven, but which it convolves to the highest union, and should be constantly conjoined with the middle genera, but exist, prior to intellectuals, for these indeed separate their kingdom from the celestial power, but the sub-celestial arch is united to the heaven, and is comprehended by the celestial order, whence also it is denominated sub-celestial, as it is conjoined therefore, to the celestial circulation, and subsists proximately from it, it converts all secondary natures to intelligibles, and perfects them according to the intellectual place of survey, for since the intellectual gods are generated according to conversion, and are convolved to themselves according to one spherical union, it is necessary that the perfective empire should be proximately established above them, hence, I am led to wonder at those who are ignorant of this divine order, and do not maintain the whole fountain of perfection, but some of them betake themselves to Entelechius, of whom we admit thus much alone, that they also can join the perfect with the form of connection, they are ignorant therefore, of the perfection which is separate from subjects, willingly embrace the resemblances of true perfections, and are conversant with these, others are gain assigned soul as the cause of perfection, who are ignorant that they do not vindicate to themselves our perfection pre-existing in eternity, and who begin from the life which energizes according to time and possesses its perfection in periods, it is necessary, however, that a perfection the whole of which subsists at once, should be prior to that which is divided, and that stable perfection should be prior to that which is moved, for the motion itself which is according to time, is indigent of end, and of the desirable, and is evolved about it according to parts, in the third place, after these, others recur to intellect, and suppose the first perfection to be intellectual, for intellect indeed, is energy and intellect. To a perfection, but it aspires after divine perfection, subsists about it, and is converted to itself through it. It is necessary therefore, that the cause of conversion should exist prior to the intellectual genera which are converted to divine perfection, and that the leader of the perfection which is one, should be expanded above the natures which are perfected. Deservedly therefore, does the sub-celestial arch prior to all intellectual natures, pre-establish an order of gods convertive and perfective of all the secondary divine genera, and on this account, Plato elevates the gods and demons that follow Jupiter, to this arch, and through this to the heaven, and the super-celestial place, for when they proceed to the banquet, and delicious food, they are sent to the sub-celestial arch, hence through this they are perfected, participate of the circulation of the heaven, and are extended to the intelligible, for the intelligible is that which nourishes and fills all things. The perfective therefore is established under the connective order, and it perfects indeed all the natures that ascend to the intelligible, 
dilates souls to the reception of divine goods, and illuminates intellectual light, but comprehending in the bosoms of itself, the second genera of the gods, it establishes all things in the connective circulation of wholes, through these things therefore, Socrates also shortly after says, that the souls that are elevated together with the twelve gods, to intelligible beauty, are initiated, viz rendered perfect, in the most blessed of the mysteries, and through this initiation receive the mysteries with a pure soul, and become established in, and spectators of things ineffable, hence the initiation of the gods is there, the first mysteries are there, nor is it at all wonderful, if Plato also tolerates us in calling the gods of this order, tell it out since he says, that the souls that are there are initiated, the gods themselves indeed initiating them, but how is it possible otherwise to denominate those who are the primary sources of teletor initiation, than teletox, for I indeed, perceiving so great an energy even as far as to the names themselves, do not see how they can be called differently, initiation however, being one and triple, for the perfective are co-divided with the connective gods, Plato calls the one union of it the subcelestial arch, in the same manner as he calls the connective order heaven, but the depth which is in it is indicated by his admit. Ting that there is in it an extreme subjection, and a steep path to the summit of the arch, as therefore, in the order prior to this, we thought it proper to arrange the intelligible according to the summit, the vital according to the profundity, and the intellectual according to the extremity, which defines the whole celestial circulation, so likewise in this perfective order, we must consider the intelligible of the arch as its summit, denominating it after the same manner as the back of the heaven, because these are coordinate to each other, but we must consider the profundity as coordinate to life, through which souls proceed to the summit, and the extremity which closes the whole arch, as coordinate to intellect. Chapter XXV. This whole order however, which is united to the order prior to it we must analogously divide, for the perfective gods are spread under all the connective triad. And one of these indeed, is the supplier to the gods of stable, 26, perfection, establishing all the gods in, and uniting them to themselves, but another is the primary source of a perfection generative of wholes, exciting things which precede according to essence, to the providence of secondary natures, and a third is the leader of conversion to causes, convolving everything which has proceeded, to its proper principle. For through this triad everything which is perfect is self-sufficient, and subsists in itself, everything which generates, is perfect, and generates full of vigor, and everything which aspires after its proper principle, is conjoined to it, through its own perfection, whether therefore, you assume the power of nature which is perfective of things that are generated, or the perfect number of the restitutions of the soul to its pristine state, or the perfection of intellect which is established according to energy in one, all these are suspended from the one perfection of the gods, and being referred to it, some are allotted a greater, but others a less portion of a perfect hypoxis, and every perfection proceeds from thence, but in short, perfection is triple, one indeed being prior to parts, such as is the perfection of the gods, for this has its subsistence in unity, pre-existing self perfectly, prior to all multitude, for such indeed is the we of the gods, not being such as the one of souls, or of bodies, since these indeed are in a kindred manner conjoined with multitude, and are come in glad with essences, but the unities of the gods are self-perfect, and subsist prior to essences, generating multitudes, and not being generated together with them, but another perfection is that which consists of parts, and which derives its completion through parts, such as is the perfection of the world, for it possesses the all-perfect from its plenitudes, and a third other perfection, is that which is in parts, but thus also each part of the world is perfect, for as this universe is a whole consisting of wholes, so likewise it is perfect from the perfect parts that are in it, according to Timorce, and in short, perfection is divided after the same manner as wholeness, for, as Timorce says, they are conjoined with each other, hence also the perfective genus is conosant with the connective, and the perfective monad is arranged under all the connective genera and as the wholeness of the heaven which connectedly contains parts is triple, so likewise perfection is triple, and if it be requisite to deliver my own opinion, all the perfections are derived from all the leaders, but the perfection which is prior to parts, pertains in a greater degree to the first leader, that which consists of parts, to the middle, and that which is in a part, to the third leader, but prior to this triad, is the intelligible triad, 
which is uniform perfection, and an all perfect hypoxis, and which Timos also denominates perfect according to all things. There, however, the three perfections pre existed unitedly, or rather, there was one fountain of every perfection, as therefore the connective, 27, triad, is the evolution of the intelligible connection, and the collective triad of the unific, and that which is the first in intelligibles, so likewise the perfective triad is the image of the all perfect triad, for the intelligible and intellectual proceed analogous to the intelligible triads, perfection therefore is triple, prior to parts, from parts, in a part, according to another mode also, perfection is stable, generative, convertive, and according to another conception, there is one perfection of intellectual and impartable essences, another of psychical essences, and another of the natures which are divisible about bodies, very properly therefore, there are three leaders of perfection prior to the intellectual gods, who constitute one order under the celestial circulation, who elevate through themselves all secondary natures to the intelligible, perfect them by intelligible light, convert and conjoin them to the kingdom of the Heaven impart an unsluggish energy to the natures that are perfected, and are the guardians of their undefiled perfection. Chapter XXVI. Such are the conceptions which may be assumed from Plato concerning the third triad of the intelligible, and at the same time intellectual orders, which at one time he denominates the subcelestial arch, possessing a summit, middle, and extremity, but at another a blessed mystery, and of all mysteries the most ancient and august through which he elevates souls and conjoins them to the mystic plenitude of intelligibles, for this triad opens the celestial paths, being established under the celestial circulation, and exhibits the self-splendid appearances of the gods, which are both entire and firm, and expand to the mystic inspection of intelligible spectacles, as Socrates says in the Phaedrus, for tele precedes muasis, and muasis, epicteria, hence we are initiated, to Leomitha, in ascending, by the perfected gods, but we view with closed eyes, i.e. with the pure soul itself, Muamatha, entire and stable appearances, through the connective gods, with whom there is the intellectual wholeness, and the firm establishment of souls, and we become fixed in, and spectators of Epoptoomen, the intelligible watchtower, through the gods who are the collectors of wholes, we speak indeed of all these things as with reference to the intelligible, but we obtain a different thing according to a different order. For the perfect of God's initiators in the intelligible through themselves, and the collective monads are through themselves the leaders of the inspection of intelligibles, and there are indeed many steps of ascent, but all of them extend to the paternal port, and the paternal initiation, in which may the teletarchs, who are the leaders of all good, likewise establish us, illuminating us not by words, but by deeds, may they also think us worthy of being filled with intelligible beauty under the mighty Jupiter and perfectly free us from those evils about generation with which we are now surrounded as with a wall. May they likewise impart to us by illumination this most beautiful fruit of the present theory, which, following the divine Plato, we have sufficiently delivered to those who love the contemplation of truth. Chapter XXVII Let us now therefore again follow Parmenides in another way, who after the intelligible triads generates the intelligible, and at the same time, intellectual orders, and unfold the continued progression of divine natures, through successive conclusions, for the connection of the words, and their dependence on each other, imitates the indissoluble order of things, which always conjoins middles to extremes, and proceeds through middle genera to the last progressions of beings, this therefore we must survey prior to the several intellectual conceptions, how the intelligible, and at the same time, intellectual triads, proceed analogous to the intelligible triads, that we may comprehend by a reasoning process the well, arranged order of things, there were three intelligible triads therefore, viz the one being, whole, and infinite multitude, and three intelligible, and at the same time, intellectual triads, have also presented themselves to our view, viz number, whole, and the perfect, hence from the one being, number is derived, from the intelligible whole, the whole that is in these, and from infinite multitude, the perfect. For the infinite which is there was all-powerful, and all-perfect, comprehending indeed all things, but being itself incomprehensible, to the all-powerful therefore and all-perfect, the perfect is analogous, possessing a perfection which is intellectual, and secondary to the first effective and intelligible perfection, the whole also which is both intelligible and intellectual is allied to the intelligible whole, but it differs from it, 
so far as the latter possesses wholeness according to the one union of the one being, but the one of the former appears to be itself by itself the whole, consisting of unical parts, and being appears to consist of many beings, these wholenesses therefore, being divided, differ from the wholeness which precedes according to union and is intelligible, for the wholenesses of this whole are parts of the intelligible wholeness, in the third place therefore, we must consider number as analogous to the one being, for the one being is there indeed occultly, intelligibly, and paternally, but here in conjunction with difference it generates number, which constitutes the separation of forms and reasons, 28, for difference itself first shines forth in this order, being power indeed, and the due had in intelligibles, but here it is maternal, and a prolific fountain, for their power was collective of the one, and the one being, on which account also it was ineffable, as existing occultly in the one and in hypoxis, but here difference separates indeed being in the one, after this likewise, it multiplies the one preceding generatively, and calls forth being into second and third progressions, breaking indeed being into many beings, and dividing the one into more partial unities but according to each of these completing the decrements, the holds remaining, very properly therefore does Plato make the negations of the one from this, for here the many subsists, through difference which divides being in the one, since a whole also which is denied of the one, is intellectual and not intelligible, the negation therefore says that the one is not a whole, so that the affirmation is, the one is a whole, this whole however is intellectual and not intelligible, Parmenides also denies the many as follows, the one is not many, but the opposite to this is, the one is many, the multitude of intelligibles, however, does not make the one to be many, but causes the one being to be many, and in short, every intelligible is characterized by the one being, for in the intelligible being and the one are complicated, and are connoissant with each other, and being is most unical, but when each of these proceeds in two multitude, they are separated from each other, and evince a greater difference with respect to each other. Each of these also is divided into multitude through the prolific nature of difference. From these things therefore, it is evident that the intelligible and intellectual orders, being analogous to the intelligible orders, proceed in conjunction with diminution. Chapter XXVIII. After this however, let us discuss each of them, beginning according to nature. First, therefore, the intelligible, and at the same time an intellectual number presents itself to our view, and which is connected with multitude, for every number is multitude, but with respect to multitude, one kind subsists unitedly, and another kind with separation, number, however, is separate multitude, for there is difference in it, for in the intelligible there was power, and not difference, and this power generated multitude, and conjoined it to the monads, number therefore is in continuity with intelligible multitude, and this is necessary, for the monad was there, and also the duad, since whole also was there, and was always monadic, and becoming to be two, has no cessation, hence the monad. And the duad were there, which are the first and exempt principles of numbers, and in these multitude was unitedly, since the monad which is the fountain of numbers, and the duad possess all multitude according to cause, the former paternally, but the latter maternally, and on this account intelligible multitude is not yet number, but is intelligibly established in the uniform principles, I mean the monad and the duad, generatively indeed, in the duad, but paternally in the monad, for the third god was father and mother, since if animal itself is in it, it is also necessary that the cause of the male and the female should there primarily pre-exist, for these are in animals, hence according to Timorce, and according to Parmenides, the maternal and the paternal cause are there, and in these, intelligible animals, and intelligible multitudes are comprehended, from these first principles also number together with difference proceed, and they generate the monads and the duads which are in number, and all numbers, for both the generative and the paternal subsist in these in a feminine manner, all the monads likewise of this triad are paternal, hence prior to other things they participate of the monadic cause, but according to the power of difference, for there indeed, I mean in the intelligible, the maternal is paternally, but here the paternal subsists maternally, just as there, the intellectual subsists intelligibly, but here the intelligible, intellectually, from that order therefore, the first number subsists proximately, but being generated analogous to the first triad of intelligibles, it also evidently proceeds from it, hence also, Parmenides beginning his discourse about number, reminds us of the first hypothesis through which he generates the one being, 
asserting that the one participates of essence, and essence of the one, in consequence of this subsisting according to the triad, and this very properly, for being intelligible and intellectual, so far indeed, as it is allotted an intelligible order in intellectuals, it proceeds from the summit of intelligibles, but so far as it precedes the intellectual orders, it proceeds from the intellectual of intelligibles, in that intelligible triad, however, the one was of being, and being of the one, through the ineffable and occult union of these two, and their subsistence in each other, but in the intelligible and at the same time intellectual triad, difference presenting itself to the view, which is the image of the concealed and ineffable power in the first triad of intelligibles, and luminously exerting its own energy, separates the one from being, and being from the one, leads each into divided multitude, and thus generates total number, for number, as we have frequently said, is divided and not united multitude, and subsists from the principles according to a second progression, but is not occultly established in the principles, hence also, it is simply different from multitude, and in intelligibles indeed, there is multitude, but in intellectuals number, for there indeed, number is according to cause, but here multitude is according to participation, for there indeed, division subsists intelligibly, but here union has an intellectual subsistence, if therefore number proceeds from these, and is allotted such an order, Parmenides very properly especially mentions these triads, asserting that the one participates of essence, and essence of the one, 29, and that through these the many become apparent, for one of these indeed, is the illustrious property of the first triad, but the other of the third triad, and in the first triad indeed, participation, 30, was the presubsistence of the union of the one and being, but in the third triad many intelligibles present themselves to the view, Plato all but proclaim. I that the most splendid of intelligibles subsists according to intelligible multitude, though multitude is their occult, and uniformly, for according to each order of divine natures, multitude is appropriately generated in the extremities. Chapter 6. The intelligible number therefore of the intellectual genera, proceeds from these, and through these, and it possesses indeed properties incomprehensible by human reasonings, but which are divided into two first effective powers, viz. the power generative of wholes, and the power which collects into union all progressions, for according to the monad indeed, it collects intellectual multitude, and conjoins it to intelligibles, but according to the duad it produces multitude, and separates it according to difference, and according to the odd number indeed, it collects the many orders into indivisible union, but according to the even number, it prolifically produces into light all the genera of the gods, for being established as the middle of the intelligible and intellectual gods, and giving completion to the one bond of them, it is carried in its summit indeed, in intellectuals as in a vehicle, but being united to intelligibles, it evolves intelligible multitude, and calls forth its occult and unical nature into separation, and prolific generation. It also collects that which is intellectual into union and impartable communion, and not this only, but generating all things as far as to the last of things, according to the incomprehensible cause of the duad and the nature of the even number, it again unites the preceding natures and convolves them according to the monad, and the sameness of the odd number, through unity indeed, and the duad, it produces, 31, collects and binds all things intelligibly, occultly, and in an unknown manner to the intelligible, and effects this even in the last matter and the vestiges of forms which it contains, but through the even and odd number it constitutes the two coordinations, viz the vivific and the immutable, the prolific and the effective, all the impartable genera of fabricating and animal producing powers, those powers that preside over a partable life, or partable production, the more intellectual and singular mundane natures, and which belong to the better coordination, and those natures that are more irrational and multiplied, and which give completion to the subordinate series, and again, through this divided generation we may see that each of the preceding natures, is united and at the same time multiplied, is indivisible and divided in its causes, and through diminution is separated from them, and we attribute indeed things that are more excellent and more simple to the nature of the odd number, but things that are less excellent and more various, to the nature of the even number, for everywhere indeed, the odd number is the leader of impartable, simple, and unical goods, but the even number is the cause of divided, various, and generative progressions, 
and thus we may see all the orders of beings woven together according to divine number which is most ancient, intellectual, and exempt from all the denumerated genera, for it is necessary that number should exist prior to the things that are numbered, and that prior to things which are separated there should be the cause of all separation, according to which the genera of the gods are divided, and are distinguished in an orderly manner by appropriate numbers, if therefore in intellectuals there are divisions, contacts, and separations of the preceding natures, and likewise communications of coordinate natures, it is necessary that number should be prior to intellectuals, which divides and collects all things intelligibly by the powers of itself, and if all things subsist occultly, intelligibly, in an unknown manner and exemptly in this summit, 32, there is a number of them, and a peculiarity unical and without separation, number therefore subsists according to the middle bond of intelligibles and intellectuals, being indeed expanded above intellectuals through intelligible goods, but subordinate to intelligibles through intellectual separations and it is assimilated indeed to intelligibles according to the power which is collective of many things into union, but to intellectuals according to the power which is generative of the many from the one, but from this highest place of survey of the intellectual gods, it constitutes the first intellectual numbers themselves which have the nature of forms, are universal, and preside over the whole of generation and production, it likewise constitutes the second numbers, which are supermundane, and vivific, and measure the gods that are in the world, but it constitutes as the third numbers, these celestial governors of the perpetual circulations, and who convolve all the orbs according to the intellectual causes of them, and it can stay. Toots as the last numbers those powers that in the sublunary region connect and bound the infinity and unstable nature of matter by forms, and numbers and reasons, through which both the holes and parts of all mortal natures are variegated with proper numbers but it everywhere connects the precedaneous and more perfect genera of the gods by the odd number, but the subordinate and secondary genera, by the even number. Thus for instance, in the intellectual orders, it produces the female and the prolific according to the even number, but the male and the paternal according to the odd number. But in the supermundane orders, it characterizes similitude and the immutable according to the odd number, but dissimilitude and a progression into secondary natures, according to the even number. For thus the Athenian guest also, orders that in sacred worship odd things should be distributed to the celestial, but even to the terrestrial powers, and according to each of these genera that which is of a more ruling nature must be referred to the odd number, but that which is subordinate, to the even number, the nature of number, therefore, pervades from on high, as far as to the fast of things, adorning all things, and connecting them by appropriate forms. For how could a perfect number comprehend the period of the whole world, as the muses in Plato assert that it does, or how could numbers, some of which are productive of fertility, and others of sterility, comprehend the descents of souls, or how could some of them define the ascents of souls in less, but others in greater periods, as Socrates says in the Phaedrus, where he delivers to us restitutions consisting of three thousand and ten thousand years. Or how could time itself which is uniquely comprehensive of the psychical measures, proceed according to number, as Tzimor says it does, unless divine number exists prior to all these, which imparts to all things a principal cause of order according to numbers, since all things therefore subsist through numbers and forms, numbers are allotted a progression, from the intellectual summit, but forms have their generation from intelligible, 33, forms for forms subsist primarily in the third triad of intelligibles, but numbers are primarily in the first triad of intellectuals, since also in the effects of these, every number indeed is form, but not every form is number. If, however, it be requisite clearly to unfold the truth, numbers are also prior to forms, for there are indeed superessential numbers, but there are not superessential forms, and according to this reasoning every form is number, as also the Pythagoreans said. For Tzimorce being a Pythagorean, not only asserts that there are intelligible forms, but also intelligible numbers, for he says that the intelligible forms are four, there however, number is intelligibly, and monadically according to cause, for intelligible animal is a monad, occultly containing the whole of number, but in the summit of intellectuals, number subsists separately, evolving the number which pre-exists in the monad according to cause and uniformly, for there is a difference, I think between saying multitude in its cause, and multitude from its cause, and between saying united, and saying separated multitude, and the one indeed is prior to number, but the other is number, 
so that according to Timors there are intelligible numbers together with forms, and prior to forms, and according to Parmenides, number is after multitude, for Timors calls uniform and occult multitude the number of forms, but since number is primarily in the gods, but forms participate of the divine. Unities, he denominates the first ideas for, for monad and triad, were primarily indeed in the gods themselves, but secondarily in intellectuals, and super essentially indeed in the former, but formerly in the latter, in intelligibles therefore, multitude was unically, but in intellectuals it subsists separately, but where there is separation there also there is number, as we have frequently observed, hence likewise all the genera of the gods are from hence generated, and they are divided, the paternal indeed and generative, among intelligibles and intellectuals, but the demiurgic and vivific, among intellectuals, and the genera indeed, that bind through similitude, are divided among supermundane natures, but those that are both exempt and distributed, are divided among the liberated gods, and the celestial, 34, and sublunary genera, are divided among the mundane gods, and in short, all the coordinations of beings receive their distinction and separation from this order, from these things therefore, it is evident what the peculiarities are which intelligible and at the same time intellectual number possesses, and of what it is the cause to the gods. Chapter XXX. In the next place, we must likewise assert that the first number, 35, is of a feminine nature, for in this, difference first shines forth, separating the one from being, and dividing the one into many unities, and being into many beings, what therefore is the difference which is the cause of these things to the gods, for if we should call it a genus of being, in the first place indeed, how is it prior to being, for separating being in the one, it is arranged between both of them, but existing as a middle, it calls forth indeed the one into generations, but it fills being with generative cause, if therefore, it is prior to being, how will it be one certain genus of being? And in the second place, after this, the different which is a genus of being, is everywhere essential, and is by no means inherent in super-essential natures, but difference itself is primarily present with the unities themselves, and separates and produces many unities from one. How therefore, can super-essential difference ever come to be the same with the difference which gives completion to essences? In the third place, that different which is a genus of being, presents itself to the view in intellectuals, according to the demiurgic order, but difference itself is the intelligible sum of intellectuals, and the former indeed, subsists together with sameness, but the latter has by itself a subsistence in the intelligibles of intellectuals, to which also may be added, that in what follows, Plato as he proceeds makes mention of difference, and generates it in conjunction with sameness, how therefore, does he effect the same conclusion twice? for he does not employ such a repetition as this in any one of the other conclusions, for whole, which he seems to assume twice, is not the same whole, viz. the intellectual is not the same with the intelligible, but these, as we have said, differ from each other, for how could be unfold to us the different progressions of divine natures, if he collected the same conclusions, according to all these conceptions, therefore, we must separate the difference which is generative of numbers from the genus of beings. But if difference itself is not the nature of the different, but a power generative of beings, it will be collective of being in the one, for everywhere power is allotted and hypoxis of this kind, for through power the one participates of being, and being of the one, power therefore was the cause, not of division, but of communion, of contact without separation, and of the habitude of the one to being, and of being to the one, hence it is necessary that it should neither be arranged according to intelligible power, nor according to the intellectual difference of beings, but that being the middle of both, it should subsist analogous to intelligible power, but should generate in the extremities of intellectuals the portion of the different. What else therefore is it than the feminine nature of the gods? Hence also it imitates intelligible power, and is prolific of many unities, and of many beings, and how could it otherwise separate number from itself, and the forms and powers of number, unless it was the cause of the divine progressions in a feminine manner? Multitude therefore is paternally in intelligibles, but maternally in intellectuals, hence, in the former indeed, it subsists monadically, but in the latter according to number, very properly therefore, in the second genera of the gods also, union is derived from the male, but separation from the female divinities, and bound indeed proceeds from the males, but infinity from the females, 
for the male is analogous to bound, but the female to infinity. The female, however, differs from infinite power, so far as power indeed, is united to the father, and is in him, but the female is divided from the paternal cause, for power is not only in the female divinities, but is also prior to them, since the intelligible powers are in the male divinities, according to Tim Orse, who says that the power of the Demiurgus is the cause of the generation of perpetual natures, for, the Demiurgus says to the junior gods, imitating my power, produce and generate animals, power therefore, is prior to the male and the female, and is in both, and posterior to both for it pervades through all beings, and every being participates of power, as the Aling guest says, for power is everywhere, but the female participates in a greater degree of its peculiarity, and the male of union according to bound, that the first number therefore, which presents itself to the view from intelligibles, is of a feminine nature, is through these things evident. Chapter XXXI. It remains then, that we should speak concerning the triadic division of it, following Parmenides. These three things therefore, have appeared to us from the beginning, according to the separation of the one from being, viz. one, difference, and being, difference not being. The same either with the one or being, for though the one and being are in intelligibles, yet difference first subsists here, since however power above, i.e. in intelligibles, was collective, but here is the separator of the extremes, there are not only three monads, but also three duads, viz. one in conjunction with difference, difference in conjunction with being, and the one in conjunction with being, for difference also is the cause of a separation of this kind, not preserving the union of the one being with genuine purity, there are therefore three monads, and three duads, but these likewise may become three triads, when we begin, at one time from the one, at another time from being, and at another from difference, hence this triad subsists monadically, and triadically. But this is the same thing as to assert that difference and the first feminine nature generates in itself, monads, duads, triads, for the divided assumption, generates for us different monads, but the conjoined assumption, duads, and triads, some indeed being vanquished by the one, others by difference, and others by being, and thus far the first deity presents itself to the view, being prolific of the first numbers, according to the one indeed, of unical numbers, but according to difference of generative, and according to being, of essential numbers, since however, from this deity which is intelligible, that which is posterior to it proceeds, it is evidently necessary that the monad, duad, and triad, should severally have prolific power, these powers therefore, Parmenides calls once, twice, thrice, for each of these is a power which is the cause of the above mentioned essences that produce either separately, or connectedly for there with respect to the generations of them, some of them are entirely peculiar, but others are common to secondary natures, the progeny therefore of these are, the oddly odd, the evenly even and the evenly odd, 36, and of these, the oddly odd, indeed, as we have before observed, is collective into union of the divine progressions, but the evenly even is generative of wholes, and proceeds as far as to the last of things, the evenly odd however, is mixed, having its subsistence from both the even and the odd, hence we must establish the first is analogous to bound, but the second is analogous to power, and the third is analogous to being, and you may see, how indeed in the first order all things had a primary subsistence, viz monad, duad, triad, but how in this order, all things are secondarily and subordinately, and the mixture which is the triad, subsisted there indeed in one way, but here the even the odd subsists in another way, for there the extremes were odd because they were intelligible, but here the even is more abundant, and the intelligible somewhat only is odd, for the middle of the triad is analogous to power, and there indeed, is the monad, which has all the forms of odd numbers according to cause, and the duad is there, which is occultly all the forms of even numbers, and also the triad, which is number primarily, but here both the odd and the even number now subsist in a twofold respect, in one place in an unmingled, and in another in a mingled manner, all things therefore, are here prolifically, but there, paternally and intelligibly, but that monad does not proceed from intelligibles, but subsists in them in unproceeding union, hence, after these, and from these, we may survey the whole of number subsisting according to a third progression, for these things, says Parmenides, pre-existing, no number will be absent, every number therefore, is generated through these in the third monad, and both the one and being become many, difference separating each of them 
and every part indeed of being part is see. Pates of the one, but every unity is carried as in a vehicle in a certain portion of being, each of these however, is multiplied, intellectually separated, divided into minute parts, and proceeds to infinity, for as in intelligibles, we attribute infinite multitude to the third triad, so here, in this triad we assign infinite number to the third part of the triad, for in short everywhere, the infinite is the extremity, as proceeding in an all-perfect manner, and comprehending indeed all secondary natures, but being itself participated by none of them, in the first monad therefore, there were powers, but intelligibly, in the second, there were progressions and generations, but both intelligibly and intellectually, and in the third, there was all-powerful number, unfolding the whole of itself into light, and which also Parmenides denominates infinite, it is likewise especially manifest that it is not proper to transfer this infinity to quantity, for how can there be an infinite number, since infinity is hostile to the nature of number, and how are the parts of the one equal to the minute parts of being, for in infinites there is not the equal, but this indeed has been thought worthy of attention by those who were prior to us. Chapter XXXII. The division therefore into three, having been demonstrated by us, we shall briefly observe, that the one appears to be minute according to this order, the one itself proceeding into a multitude of unities, and being in a similar manner becoming generated in conjunction with the one, for those three monads are the intelligible comprehensions of all orders, and they at once preside over all the progressions from intelligibles, produce all of them in an exempt manner, and collect them to the intelligible causes, since however, Plotinus admits that number is prior to animal itself, and says that the first being produces from itself number, and that this is established as a medium between the one being, and animal itself but is the basis and place of beings, it is worthwhile to speak likewise concisely about this, for if he says that animal itself has intelligible and occult number, as comprehended in the monad, he speaks rightly, and accords with Plato. But if he says that animal itself comprehends number, now separated, or which has a multiform subsistence, and is the progeny of difference, intelligible multitude is not a thing of this kind, for there indeed, the one is being, and being is the one, hence animal itself is according to all things perfect, but in number, the one is separated from being, and being from the one, and each of the parts is no longer an intelligible whole, as an animal itself, for that is a whole of wholes and everywhere the one was with being in the parts of it, and animal itself was only begotten, that number proceeded after the twofold coordinations, I mean the monad and duad, the odd and the even number, how therefore, can we place in animal itself the first number, if however, someone should say that number exists there, it is according to cause and intelligibly, but it is intellectually separated by difference, and farther still, in addition to these things, if animal itself is surveyed by someone in the demiurgic order, and he denominates it the plenitude of forms, and the ineligible of the demiurgic intellect, it will thus have intellectual number, as being arranged near the intellectual end, but if you should call intelligible animal number, in this case there will be separation and difference in the gods, whom we have asserted to be established above the whole of things, according to supreme union, for all section and division originate from the intellectual gods since here difference proceeds, adorning things in conjunction with the one and being, how therefore, does the division of the unities into minute parts, or the multiform nature of beings pertain to intelligibles, and how can the multitude of all forms accord with the first animal itself, for the tetrad was there, divided by the monad and triad, a division of this kind, being adapted to the third order of intelligible forms, for as the one being is a monad, but eternity is a monad and duad, for to be is conjoined with the ever, so animal itself is a monad and triad, since, however, it comprehends in itself the cause of all number, Timos denominates it the tetrad which is comprehensive of the four first effective causes, for the tetrad itself pre-exists as the fountain of all the production of forms, but in intelligibles the monad, duad and triad subsist unically, but in intellectuals in a divided manner, difference therefore necessarily generates all these for us with separation. For everywhere, the first of subordinate natures have the peculiar form of the natures that exist prior to them, 37, hence, the first multitudes proceed indeed from the one, but they are unical, without separation, and without number, imitating the one principle of the whole of things, very properly. Therefore, does Parmenides constitute multitude in intelligibles, 
according to the end of the intelligible order, but number in intellectuals according to the beginning of the intelligible and at the same time intellectual order, and these are conjoined with each other. Parmenides also pre-establishes unical and intelligible multitude, as the cause of intellectual numbers, and Timor shows that animal itself is only begotten, because it was monadically the cause of the whole of things, and not diadically, nor according to divine difference. That number however, is the first thing in intellectuals, we have abundantly shown. Chapter XXXII. But Parmenides begins to speak about it as follows, proceed therefore, and still farther consider this. What, we have said that the one participates of essence, so far as it is being, we have said so, and on this account the one being appears to be many but he completes his discourse about the first monad thus, are not three, things odd, and two even, how should they not and about the second monad, as follows, hence there will be the evenly even, and the oddly odd, and the oddly even, and the evenly odd, but he completes his discourse about the third and all the succeeding triad, as follows, the one being therefore, is not only many, but it is likewise necessary that the one which is distributed by being should be many, entirely so, the first triad, therefore, of the intelligible, and at the same time, intellectual gods, is through these things unfolded to us by Plato, and which possesses indeed, according to the first monad the first powers of numbers, I mean the odd and the even, and is completed through these principles which were in intelligibles occultly, viz monad, duad, triad but according to the second monad it possesses the second powers of numbers which subsist from these, i.e. from the first powers, for the section of the forms of the even number, is allotted a second order, and the oddly odd is subordinate to the first odd numbers, but according to the third monad, it possesses the more partial causes of divine numbers, hence also, a separation into minute parts, infinity, all perfect division, and unical and essential number are here, receiving ended, the unical and the essential from unity and being, but the separation of number from difference, for everywhere difference is in the three monads, but it particularly unfolds the multitudes of numbers, according to the third monad, generates more partial gods, and divides being in conjunction with the gods, for neither is deity in these imparticipable, because unity is not separate from being, nor is essence destitute of deity, because neither is being deprived of the one, since however, all things are in each of the monads, but unically and intelligibly in the firsts, generatively, and according to the peculiarity of difference in the second, and intellectually, and according to being in the third. This being the case, Plato when unfolding to us the first monad, very properly begins from the monad, and proceeds as far as to the triad, but when teaching about the second, he begins from evenly even numbers, and proceeds as far as to those that are evenly odd, both which belong to the nature of the even number. And when he adds the third monad, he begins from being, and recurs through difference to the one. For having shown that being participates of number, he from hence leads us round to unical number, employing the mode of conversion in the conception of this monad. Chapter XXXIV. If, however, it be requisite to survey the unknown peculiarity of divine numbers, and how the first order of intelligibles and intellectuals, and number which subsists according to this order, is the most ancient of all numbers, in the first place, we should consider the infinity mentioned by Parmenides, and see whether he does not say that intelligible multitude is infinite on account of this number, in consequence of its being unknown and incomprehensible by partial conceptions, for the all-perfect, and all-powerful peculiarity of divine numbers is exempt from the comprehension of partible natures, such as ours, they are therefore unknown, and on this account are said to be inexplicable, and not to be investigated. For number also in the last of things, and multitude, together with the known have likewise the unknown, and we are not able to comprehend the progression of every number in consequence of being vanquished by infinity. The incomprehensibility therefore, of this power which is unknown according to a discursive energy, is comprehended according to cause, in intelligible numbers and multitudes, for there would not be a thing of this kind in the last of numbers, unless the unknown pre-existed in intelligible numbers, and unless the former were ultimate imitations of the exempt incomprehensibility of the latter, in the second place, after this, we may also add, that unical numbers are likewise of themselves unknown, for they are more ancient than beings, more single than forms, and being generative of, exist prior to the forms which we call intelligible, but the most venerable of divine operations manifest this, since they employ numbers, as possessing an ineffable efficacy, 
and through these effect the greatest, and most arcane of works, and prior to these nature ineffably, according to sympathy, imparts different powers to different, thirty-eight, things, to some solar, but to others lunar powers, and renders the productions of these concordant with numbers, for in these monadic numbers also, the forms of numbers, such as the triad, the pentad, and the heptad, are one thing, but the unions of the forms another thing, for each of these forms is both one, and multitude, hence form is unknown according to the highest union, if therefore, monadic number participates of a certain unknown power, much more must the first number possess this peculiarity uniquely. Exempt from the whole of things, and besides this, we may also assume the anagogic power of numbers, not only because they define the periods of the physical restitutions, circumscribing our indefinite relation by appropriate measures, perfecting us according to these measures, and conjoining us to our first causes, but because likewise, number in a remarkable manner possesses a certain power of attracting to truth, as Socrates says in the Republic, leading us to intelligibles from a sensible nature, 39, as therefore, the last number is allotted this peculiarity, what ought we to say about the first number, is it not this, that it unfolds intelligible light, especially persuades to an establishment in intelligibles, and through its own order announces to us the uniform power of principles, if therefore, we rightly assert these things, we shall in a greater degree admire Timorce, who having placed time over the perfections of souls, and the whole world, through which it would become more similar to animal itself says, that time proceeds according to number, and by number measures the existence of total souls, and as in intellectuals, number is established above the celestial circulation, collecting and causing it to be one, thus also insensibles. Timorce says, that time being number measures the celestial periods, and comprehends in itself the first causes of the perfection of the periods, if also, Socrates in the Republic, in the speech of the Muses, speaks about the one and entire period of the universe, which he says a perfect number comprehends, does it not through these things appear chat divine number is perfective of wholes, and restores them to their pristine state, and that it measures all periods, the power likewise of collecting things imperfect to the perfect, accedes to all things from number, which elevates souls from things apparent to those that are unapparent, illuminates the whole world with the perfection of motion and defines to all things measures, and the order of periods, but if not only a perfect number contains the period of a divine generated nature, forty, but another second number after this is the lord of better and worse generations as the same Socrates says, number will not only restore things to their pristine state, but will also be of a generative nature, and it is evident that these things subsist in a divided manner, according to the second and third periods of numbers, but at once, and contractedly in the first of numbers, the first number there. 4. Is generative, mensurative, and perfective of generated natures. Chapter XXXV. The first order therefore of intelligibles and intellectuals is thus surveyed by Parmenides, but after this the order which possesses the middle place of intelligibles and intellectuals, and which a little before we called connective, presents itself to the view. It is however denominated in a threefold respect, viz. one, men, whole, parts, finite, infinite, for since the separation of unities and beings from number, extends to it, the one and being, which we have said difference divides, become wholes, but the things proceeding from these, are the parts of these, and wholeness indeed connectedly contains parts, but these are contained by their wholeness, in one way indeed, by the one, but in another by being, for there indeed, I mean in the summit of the intellectual gods, unity was the cause of multitude, at the same time being exempt from multitude, and generative of the many, but here unity is co-arranged with multitude, hence also it is a whole which has reference to many unities as to parts, since however, the connective order is triple, one division of it. Being intelligible, another intelligible and intellectual, and another intellectual, the first monodon did subsist according to the one and the many, but the second, according to whole and parts, and the third, according to the finite and the infinite, for where the first triad ends, there the second has its beginning, hence, in the triad prior to this, Parmenides infers that the one is many, and in this triad, he concludes the same thing together with what remains, there however, the one was generative of infinites, but here the one is comprehensive of many, the whole of parts, and the finite of infinites, hence, there indeed, 
unity is exempt from the mena, but here it is co-arranged with multitude, hence also, the first co-arrangement generates whole together with parts, but the subsistence of whole and parts produces the finite and at the same time infinite, for these are successive to each other, viz. the one, the whole, the finite, and the things which are as it were in an opposite arrangement to these, the many, parts, infinites, and the one itself is indeed the principle of the rests, but whole has now a habitude with respect to parts, and a representation of the duad, and proceeds into a co-arrangement with reference to the parts, the finite however, is now multitude, participating of bound in the one, and is as it were a triad, for it is neither bound alone, as the monad, nor infinite alone, as the duad, but it participates of bound, which is primarily a triad, everything finite therefore, is a whole, but not every whole is finite, for the infinite is a whole, whether it is multitude, or magnitude, and every whole indeed, is one, but not every one is a whole, for that which is without habitude to multitude is not a whole, the one therefore, is beyond whole, but whole is beyond the finite, after the same manner also, infinite parts are said to be the parts of that which is finite, for the infinite of itself has no subsistence, by which also it is evident that the infinite is not in quantity in energy, 41, but in capacity, all parts however are not infinite, for according to bound they are characterized by one of the parts, and again, parts indeed are many, but the many are not entirely parts, the many therefore, are prior to parts, and parts are prior to infinites, hence, as the many are to the one, so are parts to whole, and so are infinites to the finite, and these three connectedly containing monads, give completion to the middle order of intelligibles and intellectuals, for unity indeed, is the supplier of stable and intelligible connection to all the secondary orders, but wholeness connects the progressions of divine natures, and produces one habitude of the orderly, distribution of wholes, and the finite monad imparts by illumination to the conversions of second natures, connection with the natures prior to them, and one of these indeed is analogous to the one being, on which account also it is intelligible, but another is analogous to the third order, in which there was the one, and the duad which generates infinite multitude, such is the connective triad, which Parmenides exhibits to us through these things, the one therefore, is one and many, whole and parts, finite and infinite multitude, let no one however, be disturbed that Plato calls the one or being infinite multitude, for he calls the one and being when they have proceeded and are divided, infinite in multitude, for all multitude indeed, is referred to the intelligible infinity, but divided multitude, and which has proceeded perfectly, is most signally infinite, since therefore, all the primary causes of intellectuals are in this triad, and all things are disseminated in its bosoms, the first synoptius indeed, comprehends these causes as multitude, being himself an intelligible unity, and the flower as it were of the triad, but the second comprehends indeed secondarily these causes, but co-arranged and co-multiplied within, and the third, together with all perfect division, connects the multitude comprehended in himself, each of them also is connective, but one is bounding, another is giving completion to a whole, and another is uniting, Plato therefore made, and makes as he proceeds his demonstrations of the one, for the whole theory is concerning the one, but it is evident that being is co-divided with the one, for universally, it has been before observed, that every deity proceeding thence is participable, and that every portion of being participates of deity, it is necessary however, not to stop in the one alone, but to consider the same peculiarity, 42, as imparted to being in a secondary degree, since Plato also produces the one itself by itself according to the differences of the divine orders, which occasions me to wonder at those who think that all the conclusions of the second hypothesis are concerning intellect, and do not perceive that Plato omitting being surveys the one itself by itself, as proceeding and generated, and receiving different peculiarities, for how in discourse, and concerning intellect could he omit being, according to which intellect has its subsistence, power, and energy, for the one is beyond the nature of intellect, but being gives hypoxis to intellect, and intellect is nothing else than being, this opinion however of these men may be confuted by many other arguments. But if the three connective gods are divided after the above mentioned manner, and the intelligible connective deity is one many, but the intelligible and at the same time intellectual deity is whole and parts, and the intellectual is finite and infinite, each of them is very properly called much, for each of the synoches according to his own peculiarities are multitude, 
for the first about the mena, receives mena synoches of a more partial nature, the second receives these according to parts, and the third, according to infinites, if therefore, there are certain partial gods who are allotted this peculiarity, they are comprehended in this first triad, chapter XXXVI. Moreover, it is easy for everyone to see how these things accord with what is written in the Fadus for the connected one accords with the back of the heaven that comprehends these. For the one and the back are the same, comprehending according to one simplicity the whole circulation, but whole is the same with the profundity of the heaven, and with as it were the bulk of it, for the celestial profundity is a whole extended from the back as far as to the arch, an end is the same with the arch, this therefore, is evident beyond everything, and each of the other conclusions, is to be referred to the same conceptions, hence from what has been said, it may be collected, that these three things pertain in a remarkable degree to the synoches, viz. the one, whole, and the end, or the finite, for what is so able to connect multitude as the one which is co-arranged with it, what is so connectedly comprehensive of parts as whole, and how is it possible that the end, or bound, should not be the cause of binding together things which are born along to infinity, it terminates therefore, their progression, and brings back their dispersed section to the one essence of connection and thus much concerning the connective triad. Chapter XXXVII. But the third, as they say, to the Saviour, and let us also following Plato in what remains seal. Break the perfective order of the gods, because, therefore, the end of the connective order was the finite, or the bounded, the perfective order has extremes, for the end, or bound, is the extremity, there however indeed the one was said to be the finite, but here it is said to have an extremity, as receiving according to participation that which has the power of terminating many things, and there indeed, the one was end or bound, which also connectedly contains the infinite, but here having an extremity, it will also have a middle and beginning, and will be perfect, for that which receives its completion from all these, is perfect, here, therefore, the perfection which consists of parts is apparent, for the consummation of the parts, produces the perfect, moreover, because such a one as this has a middle and extremes, it will have the figure of a circumference, or it will be rectilinear, or it will be mixed, from the right and circular line, for all these require a middle and extremes, some ended with simplicity, but others with connection, three peculiarities, therefore, again present themselves to our view, the first, indeed, being that which we said was to have extremes, the second, being according to the perfect, and the third, according to figure. And there are also three perfective leaders of wholes, one indeed being intelligible, another, intelligible and intellectual, and the third, intellectual. The intelligible leader, therefore, is said to have extremes, as being directly arranged under the end of the connective gods, and in the boundaries of himself intelligibly comprehending all the intellectual orders. But the intelligible and intellectual leader, is defined according to the perfect, comprehending in himself the beginnings, middles, and ends of beings, and giving completion to the middle bond of the whole perfective triad, and the intellectual leader proceeds according to triadic figure, being the cause of bound and divine perfection, and imparting termination to things indefinite, but intellectual perfection to things imperfect, and this triad indeed is produced according to the connective triad, for the end in them is the cause of the possession of the extremity, but it is also produced from itself, for that which has extremes, having become a whole, constitutes the perfect through end, or bound, but the perfect comprehending beginnings, middles and ends, unfolds figure, and thus the perfective triad proceeds supernally, as far as to the last of things, pervading to all things, and perfecting both whole and partial causes. Chapters XXVIE. And do you not see how each of the triads conjoins the summit of itself with the ends placed above it, for the one many was the end of the collective and unknown triad? and the same is the beginning of the connective triad, the end of the connective triad was the finite, and this again is the beginning of the perfective triad, for to have extremes manifests that which consists of ends or bounds, and thus the whole middle order is connected with and united to itself, and is truly the bond of total orders, itself establishing an admirable communion with itself, but conjoining intellectuals to intelligibles, and convolving them to one impartable union, above indeed, having the intelligible and unknown triad, but in the middle producing the triad which is connective of progressions, and at the end, the convertive empire, through which it proximately converts the intellectual to the intelligible gods, 
for on what account does intellect look to itself, and is in itself, is it not because it is on all sides finite or bounded, converges to itself, and convolves its appropriate energies about itself, but why is it perfect, and full of intellectual goods, is it not because it first participates of the perfection of the above mentioned, leaders, and subsists according, to them, possessing a self-perfect essence and intellectual perception, after what manner likewise, is it said to be a sphere, both by Plato, and other theologists, is it not because it is the first participant of figure, and is intellectually figured according to it, all conversion, therefore, all perfection, and every intellectual figure, accede to the intellectual gods, from the perfective triad, for the intelligible leader of perfection, gives perfection to the ends and summits and hypoxes of holes, but the intelligible and intellectual leader terminates their progressions which extend from on high as far as to the last of things, and the intellectual leader comprehends in his own perfection, the conversions of all the gods, and bounds and perfects through figures their progressions to infinity. Chapter XXXIX. Looking therefore to this division, we may be able to survey causally many things which are to be found among other theologists, for why is one of the deities of the unknown triad carried in the first of the worlds, but another in the middle breadth, and another in the extremity, it is because the first of these was uniform, but the second proceeded according to difference, and the third, according to the infinite number of beings, but why of the three connective gods, is the first empyrean, the second ethereal, and the third material, it is because the first and did subsist according to the one, and connectedly contains the one world, but the second subsists according to whole, and divides the ethereal world, and the third according to the finite, and rules over material infinity, but why again, are the teletarchs co-divided with the synoches, because the first having extremes governs like a chariot here the wing of fire, but the middle comprehending beginnings, ends and middles, perfects ether, which is also itself triple, and the third, which comprehends according to one union, the orbicular, the rectilinear, and the mixed, 43, figure, perfects unverdured and formless matter, giving form indeed, morphosas, to the inerratic sphere, and the first matter, by the orbicular, but to the planetary sphere, and the second matter, by the mixed figure, for the spiral is there, and it gives form to the sublunary region, and the last matter by the rectilinear, for the motions according to a right line are in this region, hence, the first triad is uniformly the cause of the division of the worlds, but the second has a more abundant representation of section, and of progression into parts, yet does not exhibit to us the multitude of the worlds, and the third unfold the seven worlds, and the monad together with two triads. So great is the divine conception of Plato, that from these things we may survey the causes of what after his time became apparent, for this, indeed, from what has been said appears to be very admirable, that according to each of the triads, the middle is characteristic of the whole triad, thus for instance, in the unknown triad, difference is established as the middle between the one and being, but in the connective triad whole is the characteristic, which is the middle of the one, and the finite, and in the perfective triad, the perfect is the characteristic, which is itself established as the middle of that which has extremes, and of figure, for difference is the feminine itself, and the prolific nature of the gods, and whole is itself the form of connected comprehension, binding together many parts, and the perfect is itself the good of perfection, possessing a beginning, middle, an end, and conjoining the end to the beginning, according to the peculiarity of conversion. Being also nothing else than a perfect governor it is the cause of the peculiarity of these gods subsisting everywhere according to the middle centers, hence the whole order of the intelligible, and at the same time, intellectual gods, may be surveyed as having its subsistence in the middle, for the intelligible gods, indeed, are especially defined according to hypoxes and summits, on which account also, they are called fathers, and unical gods, for the one and father are in them the same but the intellectual gods are defined according to ends or extremities, and on this account, all of them are denominated intellects and intellectual, the intelligible, and at the same time, intellectual gods, however, being middles, especially present themselves to the view according to the middles of the triads, farther still, this also may be considered in common about all these triads, that each according to the end proceeds to infinity, for the end of the first triad is number, of the second, the infinite in multitude, and of the third. The rectilinear, which itself participates of the nature of the infinite, and of this the cause is, 
that each of the triads according to its extremity is carried as in a vehicle in the material worlds, and comprehends according to one cause the infinity of the natures that are generated in them. In addition, likewise, to what has been said, we may survey the order of the triads, from the ends that are in them. For the end of the first triad is number, but of the second, the finite and the infinite, and of the third, the orbicular, the mixed figure, and the rectilinear. It is evident, therefore, that the first triad is monadic, but the second dyadic, and the third triadic. And the first of these indeed is analogous to the one being, but the second to the intelligible whole, and the third, to the all-perfect whole. But that these have this order with respect to each other, has been before observed. In short, therefore, every intelligible, and at the same time intellectual triad, is according to its summit indeed conjoined to the intelligible, but according to its middle, unfolds its proper power, and according to its termination, comprehends the infinity of secondary natures. And here we shall end the doctrine concerning the intelligible and intellectual gods. Footnotes 1, 4. Of this. It is necessary to read. Of ton vio. It is necessary to supply in this place in the original. No eithaitria. In the original, after. Genun. In this sentence, it is necessary to supply. No itos ke noeos, to de noeon. And after. No eros. It is also requisite to supply. Genoitos. As in the above translation for, for. Teliotati. It is necessary to read. Teliotitos pende. After. Tini puanyana psida. It is obviously necessary to add. Ketoni peruanyon toponexi. The sentence that immediately follows this in the original, is so defective, as to be perfectly unintelligible. I have not therefore, attempted to translate it seven. The word. Teleti. Or initiation, says Hermes, in his miscommentary on the Phaedrus, was so denominated from rendering the soul perfect. The soul therefore was once perfect, but here it is divided, and is not able to energize wholly by itself, he adds, but it is necessary to know that Telet, Muasis, and Epicteria. Teleti, Mises. And. Epoptia. Differ from each. Other. Telet, therefore, is analogous to that which is preparatory to purifications, but muasis, which is so called from closing the eyes, is more divine, for to close the eyes in initiation is no longer to receive by sense those divine mysteries, but with the pure soul itself, and epoptia. Epoptia is to be established in, and become a spectator of the mysteries, eight. Thisi. Is omitted in the original nine, instead of osentis protistis noitis noeros. It is necessary to read. Osentis protistis noeis noitos deca. 4. Aftin. It is necessary to read. Aftis en deca de. Is omitted in the original, which the sense evidently requires to be inserted 12. 4. Enoseos. It is necessary to read. Noiseos deca tria. Here also it is requisite to adopt the same reading as before, page 252, 14, instead of. Kata timposikusan ekin. It seems requisite to read. Kata timposikusan axianos pekini. As in the translation 15, 4. Ikon. I read. Etion deca exi. I perfection proceeding everywhere. 17, 4. Kirigmati. It is necessary to read. Kirigmati deca octo. 4. Noiton. It is necessary to read. Noeron deca enea. 4. Sinefon. It is necessary to read. Sinefomenon ikosi. 4. Tonolon. It is necessary to read. Tinolin ikosi ena. I that which connectedly contains 22. 4. Ekateon. I read. Ekatea. In order that it may agree with. Apsis ikosi tria. Visas forming the celestial profundity 24. 4. Dinameon. It is necessary to read. Dinameos ikosi pende. 4. Potin. It is necessary to read. Titin ikosi exi. 4. Gonimu. It is necessary to read. Monimu ikosi ekta. 4. Ekini. It is necessary to read. Sinektiki ikosi okto. 4. Logon. It is necessary to read. Logon ikosi enea. Here it is necessary to supply. Ketin ushian tu enos triada. Instead of. Methexis. I read. Methexis trianda ena. It appears to me that the word. Proagi. Is wanting in the original, 
and I have therefore supplied it in the translation 32. It is requisite to supply in this place. En καθακοτήτητον 33. 4. Νοερόν. It is necessary to read. Νοητον 34. 4. Υπουραγνιά. It seems necessary that we should read. Ουραγνιά 35. In the original. Εφμός. Is omitted 36. Το ατιοπίσον. Is omitted in the original 37. Instead of. Πάντα χουγατα ποτίστα τον υφισταμενόν, την ίδια νέχη μοθήν. It is necessary to read. Πάντα χουγατα ποτίστα τον υφημενόν, τον ποφισταμενόν, την ίδια νέχη μοθήν 38. Instead of. Αλληλείς. I read. Αλληλείς 39. Instead of. Απαγωνίμας από τον νοητόν επί την αισθητήν φυσήν. It is necessary to read. Επαγωνίμας επί τον νοητόν από της αισθητής φυσέως 40. Every perpetually circulating body is called by Plato, a divine generated nature 41. En καθενεγή. Is omitted in the original 42, 4. Αονοτητός. It is necessary to read. Ιδιωτισός. Σαραντατρία των μικτών. Is omitted in the original. 